Okay, first question over here, Chuck. Uh, just a little factoid, uh, the city of Cleveland implemented our idle reduction policy in June of 06, and we calculated for the year of 07, we saved our city through this policy about $300,000. So if that helps you kind of understand the importance of this. Question. Uh, I'm from Olmstead Falls, and two things, um, I'm not exaggerating, but half of your life is spent sitting at the various railroad crossings. Um, and I, I've never thought, I've thought about other things, but not about the idling. And so I could see where, with the various train tracks and the, the trains that stop and block the tracks, they block the city uh, traffic. Um, it's almost like you're being held captive if you live in Olmstead Falls. Um, but the other thing was, what could we do? I would like to take uh, this information back to City Council, but I see it as very important. Uh, the second issue that, uh, thinking about this with the mass transportation, uh, also Olmstead Falls um, RTA almost took away our only bus. So um, with a lot of community effort, our only bus, one bus line was saved. Um, and so I, I just feel like there's a lot of needs that we have down there. If anybody could give me some guidance. Amy, you want to take a shot at the first? At NOACA, we did study the railroads quite a bit because I think there are issues related to the railroads. One is the one that you pointed out because clearly people end up stopped in traffic idling waiting for the trains to cross. At NOACA, we have funded some rather expensive grade separation pro projects so that the railroad tracks and the road no longer intersect. It's certainly safer and it also reduces idling. The other reason we studied the railroads was that the locomotives themselves at the switching yards, if any of your communities have railroad switching yards in them, going to want to contact NS uh, Norfolk Southern or CSX to see whether those switchyard locomotives are equipped with hot start technology so that they don't have to idle 24-7 just to move some cars now and then. The transit issue I think is one that we all lived through this year is that there was, I, I, people would call us up and say, I don't understand, everybody's riding transit now, they should have plenty of money, how could this happen? And we talked to Joe Calabrese at Greater Cleveland RTA, and he said, my ridership is up tremendously, maybe even double what it was, but my cost of fuel went up more than double, and so they ended up going into the red. So the transit was really difficult. Um, Howard, I don't know if you have information about what might happen with transit this year. Actually, <clears throat> NOACA put a, a considerable amount of money in addition to helping direct federal funds for uh, buses and, and uh, uh, other transit uh, activities, but uh, to help pay for the cost of fuel. We put in another uh, $11 million of federal funds. Uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, you know, one of the things that we've learned is that the, the RTA is approachable. Uh, you could call, I can give you Joe Calabrese's cell phone, he'll answer it. Uh, and probably uh, try to work with you in developing uh, solutions to your uh, transit issues. As far as the grade separations, that, uh, that's a, an enormous problem everywhere. Uh, I can't say that we've had huge cooperation with the railroads over the years, uh, but uh, you know, we, we do what we can. Uh, we will continue to do what we can. Uh, Mayor uh, Blomquist is, is on our board, so he's, he's actively involved in these issues as well. <coughs> question over here now this microphone that Chuck has is for the uh, video so you don't need to uh, really project your voice you know, it seems like a no-brainer when you talk about um, the reasons for passing this but I guess I'm wondering if you can anticipate what kind of resistance we may receive when we go back to our own communities either from the administration service directors you know if you could just kind of forewarn us a little bit because it, it just seems so obvious and I can't imagine but, the, I, I, thank you can I talk about the I shouldn't talk to the microphone. Yeah, but you don't have to talk. Right here. I'd say the primary resistance that you'll get from a fleet manager is that they are 
uh, saying you know that they will kind of come back to you and say that you can't do this with these diesel vehicles because turning them on and off is bad for the engine, which is true for pre roughly pre-1995, 1996, and that's a very rough estimate. I can certainly get you some more data on that. But and a lot of fleets in Northeast Ohio do have a large amount of older vehicles. Like I'll bring up the city of Lakewood as an example. They've got, uh, I think, seven of their 25 refuse trucks are pre-1988. So, I mean, they've got a lot of old vehicles, which is a good thing, you know, in terms of, you know, there, there is benefits to that. But the downside is, is that you can't do a lot of the things that I talked about, okay? But what you can do, and I think what you, the argument to that would be, Okay, well, we, we can't turn, off, turn on and off the engine to reduce particulate matter pollution or, or ozone pollution. But what we can do is retrofit these vehicles with some kind of a device and that there's money to do that, okay? And I'll, I'll just real quick give an example of the, probably the best school district in terms of retrofitting buses in the country is right here in Cleveland. Cleveland Metropolitan Municipal, I know they go back and forth, school district. It's probably the best school district in the country. They've retrofitted 90, I think 96 or 97 percent of their buses, and this is a 311 bus fleet. It's huge. They've taken about 10 years to do it, but what they've done is they've, they, they use one of the grant writers that writes grants for the rest of the district. Anytime money comes around, Mike Wiegas, who's the fleet manager there, oh, that's not Mike Wiegas, Mike Bauer, sorry. Mike Bauer, who's the fleet manager there, gives that information, they fill out the grants, and they kind of just, this ball just keeps rolling. So the grants, the money that's out there, and our, the website for my organization has that grant information out there. So that's what I would say. I, I, would, that just, your question. I would just add, stay right here, John. Um, question over here. I would just add that a uh, couple things. Um, administrations often will propose an initiative but you know it's always in the hands of the legislative body to dispose of that matter you have that constitutional right to introduce that ordinance you should in introduce that ordinance that always generates a conversation then the second thing you should do immediately is contact John McGovern and put him in contact with your fleets manager because by the time John is done with them they will see the great financial benefit and if not he's a big guy <laughs> 